All right, well, um, here's what we're going to do tonight. I, I'm, I feel like I'm going to be all over the map tonight, and I don't mean to. Um, but we're ending chapter 12, so if you have your Bibles, uh, you can go to verse 35. That will kind of give you an idea of just how close we are to the end of the chapter. Mark chapter 12. Verse 35, and with chapter 13 and chapter 14, which is coming up, we're going to be dealing with some issues that it's just not yeah. enough for us to understand Mark and Mark alone. You have to have some clarity from the book of Matthew. We have to have some understanding from Daniel chapter 9. And now that I say Daniel chapter 9, some of you are automatically thinking of prophecy and end times. And, you, and I would answer you, yes, that's exactly what we're talking about. So what I want to do tonight, with the time that we have, and hopefully we can get through all of it, is I want to finish chapter 12, and then I want to talk to you about some key, key understandings when it comes to end times, which is going to help us in the next couple of weeks to deal with the issue that Jesus is talking about in Mark, but also because we also need to have all of it, we have to look at Matthew and Isaiah and also Daniel chapter 9. So we're going to spend a lot of time in chapter 13 and chapter 14. We just can't rush that. And so we don't rush anything anyway. I know some of you guys are looking at me like, well, have we ever rushed? Well, we know we haven't. But we're going to spend a great deal more time looking at that together. Um, we spent three years going through the book of Revelation a number of years back on Wednesday night. I know that some of you uh, wondered if there was any other books in the Bible, and, and we did find out later that there was, and we began to look at those too. But Revelation is just not a book that you can rush through. So when the Lord begins to speak to us about this in Mark, it's just I don't think it's fair to anyone that we push so fast that we don't have clarity about what Jesus is saying. It's really nice that we have a class right now in, on Sunday morning in our Sunday school hour that's walking through the book of Revelation. And for some of you who aren't in that class, this is going to be very helpful to you. Some of you might be saying right now, Pastor, I just don't even enjoy, I don't even enjoy reading the book of Revelation. I understand because a lot of it is because we don't have clarity because you can't just read the book of Revelation and have complete understanding. You've got to look at the rest of Scripture. It's supported from all the other books. And once you do begin to understand it, you begin to appreciate it. Because brothers and sisters, regardless of whether or not you think you need the book of Revelation or not, I will tell you as your pastor, you absolutely need the book of Revelation. Because it is a reminder of what is to come. It is a reminder of the day in which we're living in. When we're trying to fix all of our problems through all these different ways, and at the end of the day, as we said on Sunday morning, there's only one who can fix the problems of the world. And that is Jesus Christ. What Jesus Christ has done, what he is doing, and what he is going to do is awfully important for all of us to understand. Okay? So bear with me in these next couple of three or four weeks, and we'll try to get through chapter 13 and 14 together. Okay? So if you are following along with a handout, okay, we are on page 17. And what has happened, I know it's been, it's been a few weeks that we have been able to talk about this, but... If you go back in chapter 12, you'll notice, and, you, and probably if you have your Bibles open, which by the way, I always encourage you to do that. Even though I give you not only notes, but also the scripture passages, it's very important to have your Bible open. You're going to notice that there have been three different challenges, I guess you could say, that have been given and questions that have been given to Jesus by religious leaders. We've talked about the Sadducees and the Pharisees. We've talked about different groups of people who have approached him. Uh, you can look at it really in three different ways, and this is not in your notes, but if you want to write it there, you can. There are really three different questions that have been asked. Two of them are with the purpose of trying to trick Jesus, to try to put him in a corner. The first one is, uh, is more of a political question, and that question was related to the coin, the coin that had Caesar's emblem on it. And remember that the people came to Jesus and said, hey, do we, do we give Caesar what is Caesar's or do we not? Do we pay taxes or do we not? And you remember we said that what the, the, the Pharisees were trying to do is that they under, in their minds they thought that no matter how Jesus answered the question, that it would put him in a spot and somebody would, he, would, he would have to be, he'd be in a spot where somebody was going to be angry at him no matter what his answer was. Uh, if he says, yes, pay Caesar what, it, it, what is required, 
then the Jews would be mad because they feel like they're under the authority of Rome and that's not good. But if he says, no, you don't need to do it, then he's breaking the law. So either way that he goes, he's in a spot. At least that's what they thought. But as we talked about that, we, you might remember we said that Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to the Lord what is to the Lord. And so uh, that, that put him in a spot. And of course, th they couldn't respond to that either. Uh, then the second question was the theological question, uh, a ridiculous question at that. It was a question about what happens if a woman marries a man, they have no children, and her husband dies. In that culture, it would be then for the, if there were brothers of that man, he would then take her as his wife. So the story goes, what if the first husband dies, and they have no children, and then she's married to the second husband, and she has no children with him. He dies, and it goes on and on and on. And there's seven brothers that die, and she's still left. And the question remains, when you go to heaven, who's her husband? Right? Okay? So uh, the, the stupid of, of questions, because we all understand, not because we say so, but what Scripture says, is that when we're in heaven, we, don't, we are not having that kind of relationship anymore. We are brothers and sisters in Christ at that point. It is just a silly question. That's what it was. So that's the theological question. And then the last question was not such a bad question, but it just was a reminder that we can know so much, we can be so close, but not quite be where we need to be. And that question was, what is the greatest commandment? And a man asked that question, and he said, yes, it is to love, your, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And, and Jesus says to him, you are so close, but not there yet. What a sad commentary, wouldn't it be, brothers and sisters, that, that we would have so much information, we would know so much, but never be humble to the place that we accept the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. That you could walk through the doors of a church every single Sunday morning and you could grow in knowledge and understanding, but you never accept the one who's given you that hope to begin with. What a tragedy that that would be. So, three questions. Three are posed to Jesus. And now Jesus does what only Jesus can do. He begins to pose a question to them. And so this is where we pick it up at verse 35. So here it is. It says this, While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, Why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? Now, now you need to understand that before we get too far, because we've got to look at verse 35 and 36 to understand this altogether, but you need to understand that this question was a critical question. Jesus is asking the, almost the same identical question that was asked at Caesarea Philippi when he said to Peter, who do you say I am? Because see, brothers and sisters, at the end of the day, there are going to be some people who say that Jesus is a really good teacher. He has, he's got really good morals. He's a really good storyteller. He's, he's the genie in the lamp that whenever you need something, you just rub the genie, you know, that you rub the lamp and out comes the genie and boom, you get what you need. And if that is what you have come to realize about Jesus, then you don't know Jesus at all. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. And brothers and sisters, this was not only a, a critical question for these folks that we're reading about in Mark. It was a critical question at Caesarea Philippi, and it is a critical question for us here tonight. I would like to believe that every person in this room tonight knows Jesus far more than just being a really good teacher or man is a really good moral, has good, really good moral values. I'd like to think that you love him so much that you've given everything to him. You've given all of your heart to him. But the, quite the reality is, even within our churches today, there are a lot of people who walk through our doors and walk out who are never changed. It is not because of a lack of not having the word of God it's the a, it's a lack of opening one's heart so they might receive God. And that's critical for us. And if we go wrong in this question, if we don't answer this question, then nothing else matters at all. It's the reason why Jesus looked at Martha and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he asked her, do you believe this? Martha had to understand that Jesus was more than just a miracle worker. Martha thought... If, if, if Jesus could only get here to Bethany, if he could only see Lazarus, everything would change. And for many people, that's a lot of faith compared to others. But she still didn't realize that he had power over the grave too. 
He is the resurrection and he is the life. It's the same question that Jesus posed in John when he had fed the 5,000 and then he told his disciples to get in the boat and he went off onto the mountainside and he prayed and then he went out and he went to them. And as the crowds began to gather again because they knew that he had gone across the water, they, they all go to where Jesus is. They say, oh, hey Jesus, funny catching you here. Funny meeting up with you here. How about more food? You know, that's kind of what they were kind of talking about. And Jesus basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, so if you're looking at John chapter 6, and I'm not quite on target, I, I'm, I'm trying to get as close as I can. But Jesus says, you know, I can keep bringing food all day long, and you'll keep coming right here and eating. But when the food stops, and no more miracles are given, will you still follow? And the story is told to us that the many of the disciples walked away. And then Jesus says something that I feel like every time I read it in the book of John, I feel like he's directly talking to me. And Jesus looked at his 12 and he said, will you walk away as well? Will you stop following me too? I almost can hear the heart of Jesus as he says, you have seen everything that I have done, but will you walk away too? When it's all over and done and I'm not giving you what you need anymore, when the time comes and it's going to be hard for you, and he's basically, he's told them this all the way through, when the time comes that you've got to be willing to lay down your life for me, will you walk away too? Will you stand by me? Will you trust me? Brothers and sisters, I think that's a question we all have to answer. So this is no small thing that Jesus begins to ask here. And then there's this, surprise, this surprising blow because this is the problem. If you understand what had happened, and you understand why Jesus, if you understand what was going on, you understand why Jesus is asking this question. Because here's what had happened. Over a long period of time, they had gone from believing that they, the Messiah was from God to that he was simply a human man who had come to rule on a physical throne in Jerusalem and conquer the enemies of the Jews. That's what the, had finally come down to it over a long period of time. No longer Messiah from heaven, no longer truly God. A man is going to rule, he's going to be the Messiah. A human being is going to do that. But yet, Jesus is saying, wait a minute. David said this, catch this in verse 36 and 37. He said, David himself speaking by the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, this is David speaking, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. That's directly from Psalm 110, by the way, in case you want to kind of write that down and look at it as a reference for yourself. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? If that's what David's talking about. Because you're saying that, that the Messiah is David's son, but how can he be his son and be Lord too? That's the problem. That's what Jesus is pointing out to these people. Because the Jews believe that the Messiah would be David's son. So here's our problem tonight. The only answer to that question is, is that he is sent from God and the majesty, the, the miracle of the, the birth of Jesus Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way that through the line of David that he could be his son but also be Lord. Because he's not just a human being that came along and became Lord. He is truly God. And he is truly man. It's the virgin birth that we wink, wink at and we say, well, you know, it's a good for the kids at Christmas time, right? It's a good story for them. No, brothers and sisters, it's far more than just a really good story at Christmas time. It's just as important as what we talk about when we talk about our Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross and, bled for, and died for us and was resurrected again. That's what we're talking about here. And of course, because of where we're at in the book of Mark, you know, if you go ahead and you look a little bit further, you realize that, that before this week would be over, and by the way, in case you're not aware, we're in the last week. We're during Passover week. This is where Jesus is about to go to the cross, in case you didn't catch that. In less than a week, the son of David would, be, would fulfill all that he said he would do. He would die on the cross. He would be resurrected. And yes, he is divine. That's what makes this story so important. We're not talking about people who came along to try to proclaim to be something that they were not. Jesus says, this is who I am. And he proved it. That's why you and I are in such an incredible spot to have all this that we know. And yet, even for us to have all the information that we have, we still have chosen to reject him. 
So that's kind of the storyline behind what Jesus has done here with these people who have denied him and questioned him over and over and over again. And here's where we're going to go in these next few minutes tonight, and then I'm going to try to get into what I was telling you about earlier. The church is, I think so often the church falls captive to, to, the, to the culture of our world. I think it's really easy for the church to get caught up into that. And what you're going to see in these next few verses is two things. The next section is going to give us two warnings. I want you to kind of catch this as we're about to progress through this. The first warning is against the pride of the scribe. We're going to see that in verses 38, 39, and 40. And then the very last part of this chapter, he's going to give us a warning against the pride of the rich. Now, that's in verses 41 to 44. And I just want to make it clear. I don't want you to miss this. If you grew up in a, in a background like I did, and I, I don't, I'm not trying to criticize the background that I came from, but if you grew up in the church that I grew up in, if anybody had wealth, they were automatically a sinner. There was just something about people associating wealth and being sinners. If you were rich, you're going to hell. If you're poor, you're going to heaven. That's kind of the distinction between these two categories, which is absolutely false. I don't want you to fall into that trap. I also don't want you to fall into prosperity gospel either and think that, you know, because you have wealth, it's because that God has blessed you and he's done something great. You can be wealthy and not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And oh, by the way, you can be wealthy and have a relationship with Jesus Christ all at the same time. But wealth alone does not describe your state with Jesus, where you are with him. So I want to make sure we're clear about that as we get started. So if we look at verse 38 to 40 real quick, and we'll try to finish this up tonight and get to the rest of it. And verse 38 says this, as he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows, widows' houses, and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Now I just want to stop and talk about this for just a moment. Isn't it the character that counts, not the credentials that a person has? And sometimes I think that whatever we find ourselves in, whether it's wealth or position, or we have a certain titles in the front of our name, for some people, that's what we strive for. That's what we strive for in life. We just want to have a title. We want to have, we want to have a place of prestigious you know, seats at the banquet table. But I don't know if you caught this or not, but of all the things that, that Jesus is criticizing about these people, did you see the most worst of all of it that, that he spoke about? Right in the middle of all that they do, they want their, they want their prestigious place at the banquet, ta at the banquet table. They, they, they want places of honor. They walk around with flowing robes. They pray long prayers, lengthy prayers for people to hear them. But did you catch that right in the middle of it, he says, oh, and by the way, they devour widows' houses? Of all the things that they would take advantage of, they would take advantage of the weakest and the least, of a culture? How sad it is that, that what we desire from the world, that it will drive us to go to any length to have that place of honor, to have that respect, that kind of worldly honor that comes. And Jesus said, be very careful for people who, who do not realize what it looks like and does not, and does not desire to, to be what God has called us to be. And what did Jesus come to do? He said, I didn't come to to be served. I came to serve. Can I ask you, and this is an appropriate question, when we talk about what Jesus gave to his disciples right before he, he was arrested, do you remember that he got down on his knees and he washed the feet of his disciples? When was the last time that you looked at others and said, I choose to serve you? Because brothers and sisters, we live in a culture today that is all about what you can have what is best for you, what everybody else can do for you. But when was the last time that you looked at others as more than yourself? And I don't think that this is something that we should take lightly at all because they were consumed. They were consumed with the political. They were consumed with the nationalistic idea of, of being something more than they, they were, the earthly dreams that they had. All of those things clouded their understanding of what the scripture says. And I think that that is where the danger is. It's not how much wealth you have. Have you allowed it to cloud your understanding of what God's word says? It doesn't matter whether or not you're seated at the banquet table and the best seat at the banquet table. 
Has it clouded your understanding of what God's word has to say? Because when those things become precedent over you, then you are missing everything that God has to say to you. Because I think, brothers and sisters, the greatest thing we can ever do is to be the example of Christ Jesus, and that is to serve. And there is no job too low, no job too small, that any of us ought not to be willing to do whatever it is that God has called us to do. That's part of it. There's a second part. And this, is the, this kind of goes along with what he was saying here when he was talking about these rich rulers. He then says in verse 41 that Jesus, and I want you to get this picture in your mind, okay? Because Jesus now is teaching in the temple. That's what's happening. And now Jesus kind of sets back. He kind of goes over into a corner somewhere. And he kind of sits down at the temple. And he watches as all these people are coming in and out. And there are all these boxes are there for, for them to bring in their gifts and to bring in their offerings. And he's watching as people walk by. And he notices something. People don't even realize he's there. But look at what happens. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were being put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people, I want you to catch the wording of this, many rich people threw in large amounts. Now, you know, you know one of the ways in which we learn is we, we read something, we, we smell things, we hear things. And here's one of those opportunities where you're just reading it but you've got to imagine this in your mind as you're reading it, that here these men are coming in and they're throwing this change into these boxes and you can hear the coins just banging against the coins that are in those boxes. Can you sense that, that as he's been talking about the men who are walking around in their, their lavish rows for all to see and, they're, and they're giving, they're, they long for the places at the banquet table, the best seats at the banquet table, and now here they are. They're walking into the temple and you hear their chains just hitting the boxes, hitting the coins that are in the boxes. And people are looking around and you say, wow, do you know he just gave something? Wow, do you see how much he just put in there? Do you see that picture in your mind now? Okay, catch this. Verse 42, but a poor widow came in and put two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. And you have to understand that these, these two little coins, right? They're not just small, but they're thin. There's no weight to them because the value of it is very, very small. And the woman comes in, she has two coins. That's what she has. That, brothers and sisters, is all she has. And when she places those two, those two coins in the box, there is no noise. There is no clamoring of change that hits the box and falls and hits the other coins. It makes no noise at all. You can imagine that. Lighter weight, less noise. Now I want you to see what Jesus says. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. Now, how's that possible? How, how's that possible? We already know what they gave. We already know what she gave. And then he explains. Verse 44. They all gave out of their wealth. And that word wealth there is really abundance. So when you think about what they had given, it was out of their abundance. But she gave out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Now, who gave the greatest gift? Well, we don't have to wonder that. When you have so much that, that you can give uh, handfuls at a time, and you don't miss it because that's just, that's just out of your abundance. It doesn't hurt you. It doesn't str make strenuous situations on your life. But here she comes in, she's got two little coins, and she could have easily given one coin, but she still had another coin. And I think if she would have only given one coin, brothers and sisters, wouldn't we still have said, that was pretty good. She only had two coins, and she gave them both. She gave everything. And you know what she's really saying silently and quietly to God? She's saying, I love you so much that I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you my heart. I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you all of me. What do you think the man gave or the men gave when they came in who, who were giving out of their abundance and threw it into the boxes? 
they aren't going to miss a thing. They wouldn't miss it for a second. And yet we walk around proudly like we've done something special. And here are these two little coins that, that wouldn't do much of anything. It was all she had. And she was a widow. There was no set income that was about to come to her. This was all she had. And I think that's exactly what Jesus is pointing out to you and to me. What does Jesus want from you? He wants all of you. Not some, but all. How many of you ever heard of cirrhosis of the liver? Anybody ever heard of that? I should end on a better note. I feel like I should. Um, I wish I could have come up with this. I'm just not smart enough. Kit Hughes, who's, a, who's a, one of the commentaries that I enjoy reading, uh, did a commentary on, on the book of Mark. And he wrote the story about cirrhosis of the giver. I thought I would just read it to you tonight as, we, as we're about ready to transition to where we're going. This is what he says. He says, it was actually discovered, the cirrhosis of the giver, was actually discovered about 34 A.D., and ran a terminal course in a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. That's in Acts chapter 5, in case you want to go look. It's an acute condition which renders the patient's hands immobile when it attempts to move from the billfold to the offering plate. Are we following along so far? The remedy is to remove the affliction from the house of God. Since it is clinically observable that this condition disappears in alternate environments, such as golf courses, clubs, or restaurants. I just thought I'd read that to you. Cirrhosis of the giver. It's amazing how, when it comes to the way that we give to God, we think awfully hard, do we not? But when we go to the restaurant, to the golf course, to the places you go, wherever that is, we don't have much of a problem at all. And then it only reminds us of the widow who was willing to give all. And yes, I know what you're thinking. Of course, Pastor, you'd have to sneak a tithing message in there somewhere. <laughs> and I'm not. And I choose not to. Because no matter what I say to you here, it will not matter until you have changed something here. But when you do change this, you don't look at what you do the same. And I praise God for that. Because that won't be me talking you into it. It'll be the Spirit of God talking you into it. Okay. Now you're probably wondering. I've got ten minutes. This is going to be helpful, I hope. If it's not, just pretend like it is and we'll, <laughs> we'll all get along. So there's some terminology that I think will be important in the next couple of weeks as we look at Mark chapter 13, Mark 10. I don't assume that even those of you who spent three years with us going through the book of Revelation are going to, are going to remember all of this, and so it's okay. We'll talk about it again. You don't have to write it down now, but you can. I didn't, I didn't uh, ask you to bring paper and pencil tonight so you can take notes. Um, probably what I will do is I'll type this out just so you can have it and you can use it as a guide. There's no sense in you having to write all this down. Uh, Time-wise, we won't have time for you to write it down while I'm talking. But I want to give you some specific things that are important when it comes to end times, okay? And they're not hard things. I'm not going to get into all the, you know, the different bowls and the trumpets and those things tonight. Uh, that's something we do when we go through the book of Revelation, but I want to talk about some specific things that are going to help you to understand end times a little bit better. The first is, I'm going to use some words, and I'm going to give you definitions of the words. I'm going to talk a little bit about where they possibly could land, but I'm not going to sit here and try to say to you tonight that, oh, Pastor Dave knows exactly what's going to happen and when it's going to happen, and, and you know, it's, it, it, he's completely right, and it can't, be, it can't be different. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying these are things that we know are to happen, but you need to at least know what they are, okay? So... The first word that I'm going to use is a word that you hear pastors talk about all the time. We anticipate it. We long for it to happen. It's called the rapture. Has anybody ever heard of that word before, the rapture? Okay, so the rapture certainly is something that we talk about. 
And the rapture is something that if you're talking about signs and signs to come, that we're anticipating that this has to happen, that has to happen before the rapture occurs, then I need to tell you, brothers and sisters, there is nothing that needs to happen. There's no sign that has to happen for the rapture to occur. All those things are done. It's over. Jesus has already done what he was supposed to do and what he longed to do. The rapture is about us being lifted up to be with him. It is when the church is lifted up at the end days. And the rapture is different than the second coming. And that's another term that I want to give to you because the rapture is something that happens to us. We are lifted up to be with Christ. He, we are lifted up in the sky to be with him in the sky to be with him. The second coming is very different because the second coming happens later. And I'll get to that. So just keep that word second coming into your mind for just a moment. The next word that I want to give to you is a word that gets debated amongst people in the church. And it's fun to do, but it's really just something that none of us really know, but I think I'm pretty close to knowing. So <laughs> I'm just throwing that out to you. And that is the tribulation. Anybody ever heard of the tribulation? Okay, so tribulation for some people is not a literal period of time, but we believe that it is. We believe that there is what we call pains that are going to occur, but then there is this thing called seven years of tribulation that increasingly over those three and a half, first three and a half, second three and a half years, totaling seven years, literal seven years, there will be a continual increase in pain, increase in things that have never happened before. And I need to explain that real quick. We believe in three different things when it comes to the tribulation. There are people who believe that the rapture that we just talked about a moment ago, the rapture will happen by some people's viewpoint, when it's mine as well, is what we call a pre-tribulation. And what that simply means is, is that before that seven-year period begins, that the church is lifted up to be with the Lord. There are those who believe in a mid-trib, which is in the middle of the seven-year period of time, that's when, the, that's when the rapture occurs. It's really about the rapture and when does it occur. Is it the pre-trip before the tribulation actually begins? Is it mid-trip in the middle of the tribulation? Or is it the third one, which is what we call post-trip, when it is after the seven-year period of time? Now, I'm not here to throw rocks at anybody who has this viewpoint, but most people land in a pre-trib place. Some are mid-trib. There are people who are post-trib, but brothers and sisters, from a theological standpoint, it is hard to grasp the post-trib for me, from a biblical standpoint. I, I'm, that's just my viewpoint, but I, I just I can't see it in Scripture. And, I, and so I'm just throwing that out there to you, okay? So, at some point, whether you are pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, and whenever that rapture occurs, there are some judgments that occur that I think that you need to know and be aware of. And again, it's like the rapture and the second coming. Sometimes people get those two things confused. Well, people also get these next two things confused. And that is the judgment seat of Christ and what we call the great white throne judgment. And there are two very different judgments. The judgment seat of Christ is specifically for one group of people, and the great white throne of judgment is specifically for another group of people. The judgment seat of Christ is something that happens, and it sounds really bad, and I guess it could be, but, but it's really about the judgment of the believers, the works of the believers. What did you do for Christ? The judging of, of your actions and your motives and all those things as a believer on this earth. And so there's a judgment when the judging of the saints is given. Now, when does that judgment happen? Probably after the tribulation or right after, the, the, before Christ comes for the second coming. It's somewhere in there that the judgment seat occurs. Now you need to understand that what happens after that seven years is up. What do we do after the tribulation? Well, again, there are people who, and I'm going to describe one group of people, and that is what we call the amillennial group. And now you don't need to write this down. But the amillennial group believe that that thousand year period of time has already happened. Everything that was going to happen in a thousand years happened after Christ was resurrected. We don't believe that. We believe in a literal thousand year reign when the second coming occurs. So I want you to hear me all the way out here that the second coming is after 
the tribulation period. That's the time in which Christ is going to rule for a thousand years on the earth. And during that time, believe it or not, there will be much peace during that time. Now, I need to make sure that I'm clear. And I didn't say this about the tribulation, but brothers and sisters, I believe, and most, the, most theologians believe, that the tribulation period is more for the Jews than it is for the church. Because the church is lifted up somewhere, in, in, in probably before the tribulation begins. But I believe, and many do, that the tribulation is for the Jews that are going to return back to Christ during that time, during the time of tribulation. And there's much information that's given to us in Revelation that I think that backs that up very clearly. But during that time of that thousand-year reign that Jesus is here, we call that the millennial period. That's a thousand-year reign of Christ. Now, at the end of that thousand-year period of time, there are some things that happen, and they happen fairly quickly, okay? So at the end of that thousand-year reign, Satan is loosed again, and he's allowed to go and to, to build his army up. And I just want to quickly ask, how many of you have ever heard of the Battle of Armageddon? Anybody ever heard of that before? Okay, so that sounds like this incredible battle and this war that's going to take place, and it sounds harsh and hard, and it could be, except that the battle hardly begins, that Battle of Armageddon after the thousand-year reign, hardly begins before God does what only God can do, and that is to take down Satan and throw him into the lake of fire for all of eternity. It is at that time that we talk about that second, that second judgment that we sometimes get confused with between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne of judgment. And that great white throne of judgment is a separate judgment for those who chose to not to believe, for those who have rejected Jesus Christ. Now those are all terminology that people use as we discuss Revelation. And there's much, much more. But in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about, and you might say, Pastor, are you, are you just trying to do filler or something tonight? Are you 10 <laughs> minutes? Is that what you're doing? Uh, the reason why I'm telling you that is because in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about something that probably is something that is foreign to you. Uh, Daniel chapter 9 speaks about the 70th week. And what that is, it's that period in the tribulation. It's a period in which some things happen that you need to understand. And it's going to be important that you understand these other things as it relates to this period of time. And I know that for some of you, you may not care. But I think what you're going to learn through this is, is that when God says something, and he says, I'm going to do something, he does exactly what he says he will do. And what you're going to find is that the very amount, the very amount of time, and by the way, you might wonder what this 70th week is all about, okay? The Jews owed him 70 years because in their time of caring for their fields, they were supposed to give one year out of seven a time to rest, and they did not do that. And he, he, put, them into, he put them into bondage because of that, and they served 70 years in Bab in, 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 under Nebuchadnezzar. You might remember that. Well, in that respect, he gives them this, this prophecy that speaks about this period of time from the time in which the temple is restored to the time that Jesus comes on the scene and who is proclaimed to be who he is. Now, you need to understand, we're given exactly the dates and the time for both of those things. We know exactly when the temple was rebuilt, and we know the time in which Christ proclaimed who he was as Messiah. We know because the scripture tells us that when he rode in on that donkey, which is what we've been talking about right now, that's why all this is coming up, this is why Mark's talking about what he does, it was the very day that we know, it, we know the very season that we were in, and we know the very time that the temple was rebuilt, because we know it with Ezra and Nehemiah. So now, when he says, this is what you owe me, this is the amount of time that's going to go by before uh, all this is going to occur, and guess what? The very amount of time, the very amount of time that he says that all this was going to happen wasn't within a close proximity. It wasn't within a month of one another. It was to the exact day. And i got to tell you, that's not by accident. That's exactly what only God can do. And we're going to talk about that in the next two chapters of chapter 13 and chapter 14. And now I'm looking at you, and your eyes are looking at me with this death stare, and I promise you, it won't be that bad, okay? So don't, don't, don't think, well, I'm taking, two I'm taking two weeks off. That's what I'm going to do. You won't want to do that, okay? I promise you. I won't make it hard on you. 
All right, with that said, it is time. Yes? Can you have that um, typed out for us? For this I will. What I just shared with you tonight, yes, I will give you this. I'm going to type this out so you'll have this next week when we start Chapter 13. Okay? Here's what, yes, one more question. Oh, okay. It, it will. Yeah, I didn't want to tell them. I thought if I only said two weeks, if they do take two weeks off, I'll get them at the end of that. But <laughs> I didn't want to say it out loud. But, you, but you, everybody probably knows, so it doesn't matter, right? So, okay. So here's what we're going to do. Let's close for a word of prayer, okay? Father, how grateful we are, Lord, to be in your house. And, and certainly, Lord, to have fellowship with one another. Lord, to be encouraged by your word that, that only draws us closer to you. Sometimes, Lord, it does because of conviction. Sometimes it's because of encouragement. Sometimes it's just because of a grace that we do not deserve that, Lord, you bestow upon us. That you allow your Holy Spirit to speak to us in a way that only you can. Not by my words, not by anyone's words, but by yours. So, Father, tonight I pray that as we leave this place that we be reminded again and again of, Lord, the call that you have put on each of our lives as, as, as what you call your holy people, your saints. That, Lord, that we would look like, we would act like, we would live like that which you've called us to be. Not by the world's standards, but by your standards. And Father, though we fall short, Lord, we are grateful that we serve a God who's full of compassion, who never gives up and never throws us away. Father, we praise you for that tonight. We give you all the glory. Father, it's in your precious and wonderful name that we pray. All God's people said...